Now, I tell you, every time I go away and then I come back, it makes me feel like I should have stayed away um, oh, because of how many good things I hear uh, from everyone uh, when, I, when I wasn't here. And so uh, that's, that's so good to hear. And so uh, I'm glad to be back this morning. We're continuing our series in the book of John. So go ahead and pull your Bible out. Turn to John chapter 17. John chapter 17, starting in verse 1. If you uh, do not have a Bible, there is a stack of hardback black ones there on the table at the Connect Center. Uh, consider that a gift from us to you if you don't own a Bible. It's very important to have a physical one, and so if you don't own one, consider that a gift uh, from us to you, an early Christmas present. But we're in John 17, starting in verse 1. As you're turning there, uh, I heard a story this week about two people from a church. It wasn't this church, but these people made a friendly bet with each other. You see, they were at church and they were arguing and kind of debating these biblical and theological issues. And if you've been around two very passionate, zealous Christians, sometimes you know that it can get a little bit heated at times. And so they were arguing and they were debating. And one guy, finally fed up, said to the other, he said, you know what? I bet you $10 you can't even recite the Lord's Prayer. And the other guy kind of looked at him and was like, all right, I'll take that bet. I know the Lord's Prayer. And he said, all right, go for it. And so he paused for a moment. And he said, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And he went on and on and on and on. And the other guy who made the bet against him kind of stood there and looked at him kind of inquisitively and said, well, I guess I owe you 10 bucks. <laughs> Now, of course, that's not the Lord's Prayer. That's an 18th century nursery rhyme that kids are taught in Sunday school and have been taught for many, many, many centuries. But uh, the real question is, if I were to ask you, astute Bible students here at RVC Rogue River, what is the Lord's Prayer? You would probably say, oh, I know that for sure. Matthew chapter 6, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and so on and so forth. And you would recite it because you are elite Bible students of the day, right? And you would be partially right, because in your Bibles, when you look at Matthew chapter 6 and you look at that part in the Bible, the heading above that passage of Scripture does, in fact, say the Lord's Prayer. But is it really the Lord's Prayer? You see, when we look at it in context, it's actually probably not the Lord's Prayer. You see, in the context of Matthew chapter 6, you remember the disciples went up to Jesus and they said, hey, Jesus, teach us how to pray. Tell us how we ought to pray. And then, and then Jesus says, okay. And then he goes through, right? Our Father who art in heaven, pray in this way. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. So on and so forth. But this prayer isn't necessarily for Jesus. How do we know that? Well, in Matthew chapter 6, part of this prayer is forgive us our debts as we've also forgiven our debtors. Well, Jesus owes nobody anything. He's in debt to no one. And so this prayer isn't primarily for Jesus. In fact, more accurately, this is probably the disciples' prayer, not the Lord's prayer. So if Matthew 6 isn't the Lord's prayer, what is? Well, it's what we're going to read today. It's John chapter 17. This is the Lord's prayer. This is truly the prayer of Jesus. In fact, fun fact about John 17, John 17 is the longest continuous prayer that we have in the entire Bible from the lips of Jesus. Isn't that interesting? And this is a very special prayer, especially when we understand the context. And so I want to get us back up to speed here on what's taking place in the book of John, because last week we kind of took a break. So here's what's happening. Jesus was in the upper room with his disciples, right? And he was having dinner with them. And then you remember that little rat, right? That little dude, Judas, scurries up, goes down the stairs to betray Jesus to the religious leaders. Well, in that period, from John 13, 14, 15, and 16, Jesus does something quite spectacular. He basically takes all of his disciples to school. And he teaches them incredible truths about things that they're going to need to live a Christian life. And so I'll I'll give you some examples. Remember, right when they get up to the upper room, do you remember what Jesus does? He wraps a towel around his waist, he gets down on his hands and knees, and he starts scrubbing the disciples' feet. He starts cleaning their feet. And he teaches them right here the importance of service. And this is a radical thing. That's something a servant did. But here is the esteemed guest, the man of the hour, wrapping a towel around his waist and serving his disciples. In John 14, remember, Jesus reassures his disciples about eternal life. He, he talks about how he's going away to prepare a place for them. Remember that? In my father's house, there are many rooms. 
We talked about how in Jewish culture, the son would go away, he would grab the, the, or he'd get engaged to the girl, he'd come back, and then he'd build onto his father's house. Jesus says the same way that a young man would go and get his bride and then come back and build a place for her, that's what I'm going to do for you in eternity. That's John 14. In John 15, he talks about the arrival of the Holy Spirit. And he tells him about the kind of peace that only he can offer. Are you downtrodden? Are you sad? Are you sorry? Are you, are you hopeless? Jesus says, good news, I'm sending the Holy Spirit. And with that Holy Spirit comes a peace that only I can give you. It's an incredible, incredible, incredible thing. And so all throughout these chapters, Jesus, just picture him just in a room walking with his disciples. And he is sharing with them incredible truths that they need to continue to traverse through this thing called life, specifically when life is gonna get a whole lot more difficult here in the coming months. And then we get to John chapter 17, and it's so, so, so cool because Jesus transitions from instructing all of his disciples and lecturing them and teaching them. And then in John 17, I just picture Jesus sort of just walking over to an alleyway and sliding in an alleyway, and he begins to pray. He begins to pray. The whole vibe, the whole rhythm of this text just changes completely and Jesus begins to pray and boy, oh boy, does he pray. John 17 is gonna take us two weeks to get through and the title of the lesson today is Jesus Prays Part One and then next week we're gonna look at Jesus Prays Part Two and so really this is a part one and a part two so make sure to come back next week to see the culmination of this prayer. Today we're going to be looking at certain principles in the prayer of Jesus that we ought to learn from, that we can learn from and benefit from our own life, but also more importantly than that, so that we can see Jesus for who he is and fall deeper in love with him. That's the purpose of today. But in an effort to make this uh, story or this prayer make more sense to you, I want to show you the way in which Jesus organizes this prayer. In verses 1 through 5, you can see that Jesus is praying for himself. That's what we're going to be studying today. Jesus prays for himself primarily in verses 1 through 5. Next week, we're going to see Jesus pray for his disciples in verses 6 through 19. And then uh, also next week, we're going to see that Jesus prays for all believers in chapter or in verse 20 through 26. And so next week, we're going to be here for a long time because we've got to cover a lot of ground from verses 6 to 26. But with all of this in mind, let's go ahead. Hopefully you're there. John 17, verse 1. Let's see what the prayer of Jesus looks like. Here's Jesus. It says, Jesus spoke these things... He looked up to heaven and said, here's his prayer, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so that the son may glorify you. Since you gave him authority over all people so that he may give eternal life to everyone you have given him. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and the one you have sent, Jesus Christ. I have glorified you on the earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, glorify me in your presence with that glory I had with you before the world existed. Amen. So there's a few things here from this passage that I want us to take note of. But the very first thing that I want us to see is in the very first part of the prayer, which is this. Number one, if you're taking notes, you can write this down. It's the posture of prayer. The posture of prayer. Of prayer. Look again at verse 1. It says this Jesus spoke these things and looked up to heaven. Now, there's three things about the posture of Jesus here that I want us to, in particular, take note of. First and foremost, we see that Jesus is speaking out loud when he is praying, right? He's speaking out loud when he is praying. The second thing we need to see is that he lifted his head up and was looking to the heavens. And then the third thing that we're going to assume is that Jesus' hands were lifted up in this way with his palms outstretched to heaven. Now, why are we making that assumption? Well, here's why. You see, in traditional first century Jewish culture, this was the custom of the day when people prayed. They would pray with their eyes open, their heads lifted to the sky, with their palms up, praying to God. You say, okay, well, why is that important? Well, every culture seems to have a certain kind of standard as to how we pray, right? Today, in this day and age, when we pray, like when we pray together, when we pray by ourselves, maybe some of us will take off our hats, we'll sit there, we'll, we'll, we'll sit down, we'll close our eyes, we'll bow our heads, and we'll fold our hands. Why? Well, because that's just what we do. Well, in this culture, this is sort of what they did, and there was significance to it, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But the real question is why are we talking about this? Why aren't we making so much of a big deal about the posture of Jesus here in John chapter 17? Great question. Thanks for asking. Here's why. Here's why. 
It's because prayer posture matters. Do you hear that? Prayer posture matters. Prayer posture matters. Now, don't get me wrong. Am I saying that every single time you pray, you need to walk out with your hands outstretched, talking verbally, making sure that everybody sees exactly what is going on, and if you don't pray that way, then God's not gonna hear you because your posture is not right. And if you're not performative in your prayers, then sorry, Bucky, it's not gonna work. No, that's not what I'm saying. That's not what the Bible teaches. But what I do want us to see is this. It's the intentionality of the way Jesus prays. That's what we need to see here, is the intentionality of the way Jesus prays. When Jesus is praying here, you can't help but see that his focus, his attention, and his heart is securely fastened and focused on communicating with his Father. There's no doubt about that. When he's talking with God, he's doing that. He's talking with God. He's communicating with his father. Now, here's a question that I have for you and me. When was the last time we prayed, you prayed, where our heart, our mind, our body, and our attention and our posture was securely focused and fixated on communicating with the God of the world? When was the last time we were so focused on the task at hand, which is to communicate with God Almighty? You know, it, it's interesting to me, uh, doing student ministries. I, I just wrapped up my time in student ministries. For seven years, I was with a small group of, of middle schoolers, and now, now they're in, in college. But um, it's so interesting. Every single time when we would go away as a student ministry here at River Valley, whether it be Mexico or winter camp, I'll tell you what, one of the main takeaways that students would always have getting away to these retreats or getting away to a different country was, wow, the prayer time was really powerful. It's very interesting, and as leaders, we, we know that. Now, 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 why is prayer time super powerful in, in Mexico or at winter camp? Well, here's why. Because at River Valley, when we take kids and we, and, we, and we go somewhere else, we go to a camp or we go to Mexico for a mission trip, there's a few things we do. Number one, we don't allow electronics. So there's no cell phones. So some kids are having like phantom vibrations and they're like, there's got to be something. It's like, no. And it's interesting. Kids act like kids um, without their cell phones. It's, it's really cool. They can still do it without their phones. It's awesome. Another thing is they're completely away from other kinds of distractions. It's not like they have a TV or an Xbox or something that can consume all of their time. And so when these kids are completely out of their element, and then when we force them essentially to have quiet time, we call it one time with God, the craziest thing happens. Prayer makes an impact on them. The craziest thing happens. Kids walk away and go, I'll tell you what, there was something about prayer time that really hit me. There's something about prayer time when I was communing with God that just made a big impact on my life. And, 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 and sometimes I think about that when I get back from trips and I go, why in the world can't we as Christians have that kind of intimacy with God here? And then it, and then it dawned on me. It dawned on me. It's because you and I get attacked by a demon. You say, what demon? Here's the demon. It's called the demon of distraction. You know what I mean? You know that demon. You, you, you know what it's like. I think some of you know what this is like. You go, okay, time to communicate with God. And so what do we do? We, we sit down. We, 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 we put our phone away. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe we don't. And then we, and then, and then we close our eyes and, we, and we, we get our, our, our comfy shoes on and we sit on the couch. We go, okay, I'm going to pray. And then, and then we start praying. And then about 15 seconds goes by. And then you go, oh, wait, what am I having for dinner tonight? Um, was my wife actually mad when I said that or was she just kind of joking Oh, no, that ticked her off. Dang it. Um, oh, by the way, I wonder what show we're, are we going to watch a show tonight? I wonder who's going to get eliminated on Survivor. And then your mind, your mind just keeps going. It just keeps racing. And then you sat down and you're like, I'm going to pray. And the next thing you know, you're, you're thinking about steak or something, right? You're thinking about something totally different from what you sat down originally to do. Now I'm speaking from experience here and I assume that a lot of you can relate to that. But you and I both know that our prayers seem to upscale to 4K definition when we turn our phones off, we remove technology, and our physical body is representing the intentionality of what is going on inside of us. There's something different about that. There's something more powerful about that. In fact, did you know that all throughout the Bible we see different postures of prayer? I want to give you some examples. We see people in the Bible praying with their hands lifted up in 1 Timothy 2.8. 
Paul says, in every place of worship, I want men to pray with holy hands lifted up to God, free from anger and controversy. We see people sitting and talking with God. In 2 Samuel, I love this, uh, King David went in the tent and he sat before the Lord and he just started talking with him. Who am I, sovereign Lord, and what is my family that you've brought me this far? We see families praying together as a unit, 2 Chronicles 20, 13, all of Judea. What a cool scene. Imagine the entire country of Judea standing before the Lord with their wives, with their infants, and with all of their children as a family unit. And the context there is communicating with God in prayer. We see people bowing in prayer. Remember this, Exodus 34, Moses bowed to the ground and at once worshiped. We also see people lying on their faces in prayer. Deuteronomy 9.25, I lay prostrate before the Lord. We see prophets in the Old Testament laying on their backs and communicating with God. And so there are many different prayer postures that we see all throughout the Bible. And all of them are wonderful. But the reason I wanted to spend time on verse 1 here is to remind you and me that our posture in prayer can help us with our intentionality in prayer. And our intentionality really matters. You and I both know that the difference between doing something and not doing something is being intentional about that thing, right? Oh, I'm gonna do this. Well, are you really gonna do it? You're not being intentional about it. There's something about posture in prayer that helps us be intentional with prayer. And I wanted us to see this first and foremost really early on just in this study of prayer to kind of kick off the part one and the part two is prayer posture. It helps us with our intentionality in prayer. So we see here verse or point number one is that posture in prayer matters. And then the second observation I want us to see here is kind of a 1A, 1B um, thing. And I'm gonna have you add something in. It's the expectancy of prayer. But if you're taking notes kind of on the back end of that, I want you to write in the organization of prayer as well, okay? So expectancy of prayer and then also the organization of prayer. Now, uh, this is gonna be fun. You guys are gonna like what we're gonna do here. Um, this is gonna really get you nerds super, super jacked. And so he he here's what we're gonna look at. We're gonna look at the way in which Jesus organizes the prayer here in verses one through five. And so let's go through it again. Verse one, Jesus starts it out by saying, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son. Can we say glorify together? Ready? Glorify. Say it again. Glorify. Glorify your son so that the son may glorify you. Notice the request from Jesus. He says what? He says, glorify. He says glorify. He says glorify me. That's the request here. So in verse one, he says, glorify me. Now, let's transition to verse two. And what we're gonna see here is that Jesus is gonna list reasons as to why the Father should glorify him. Look at verse two. Since you gave him authority over all people, he's speaking in the third person, by the way, Jesus says, since you gave me authority over all people so that I may give eternal life to everyone that you have given me. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and the one you have sent, Jesus Christ. I have glorified you on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. So again, Jesus is speaking in the third person here, and he's saying, I came to earth for a purpose. That purpose was to give eternal life to those who believe in me, and he says here at the end of verse four, I'm going to complete that work. I've completed that work. And so in verse one, he makes a claim, glorify. And then in these few verses, he gives reasons as to why that request should be met. And then look at verse five, look at this. He says, now, Father, glorify me in your presence with that glory I had with you before the world existed. And so Jesus then wraps up this section by making the request again. He starts out by saying, glorify me. He gives reasons as to why he should be glorified. And then he follows it up in verse five by saying, glorify me. So he makes a request. He lists the reasons as to why that request ought to be fulfilled. And then he makes the request again. Now, that's a pretty good model for us. Now, keep in mind, praying this way is not a hack to get God to give you what you want from him, okay? Praying this way and organizing your prayers like this is not a way that you can twist the arm of God to getting you a Bugatti, okay? So I, I don't want anybody thinking here, okay, Austin, our pastor. So my request is this. My request is success. Why? Because success is going to make my life happier. My wife is going to like me more. Uh, it's going to give comfort to my family. It's going to do so much more for my life. So give me success. Isn't that what I got to pray for, pastor? I organize my prayer the way Jesus did. No, not at all. Praying this way does not give us a foolproof way of getting what we want from God. And so let's talk about this for a minute. Let's zoom out. 
I want us to zoom out real quick. I just want, we're just going to broaden our horizon a little bit. We're going to use that fisheye lens that some of you geeks with iPhones have. And we're just going to zoom out. And I want to ask a simple question. Why do we even pray? Think about that. Why do we even pray? Like, why do we, why do we even do it? Like, what is, the, what is the purpose of prayer? We hear people talking about it all the time, but like, why does it even matter? You know, for some people, unfortunately, it doesn't matter. Um, I, as I was studying this week, I came across a pretty sad quote from Nicholas Sparks. He's that guy who writes all the love books, right? Um, the notebook and pretty, they're all the same, but, you know, there's a woman, she's sad, she's on the run. There's a really good looking lifeguard and it's love. Um, but Nicholas Sparks said, and it, it's, it's kind of sad, he said, I don't pray because it doesn't work. Prayer doesn't fix anything. I was like, dang. So maybe you think that. Maybe you're like, you know what, I, I, I don't need to pray because if we're being honest here, prayer doesn't work and it doesn't fix anything. Maybe that's some of us. We just don't see the need for prayer. Or maybe there's some of us that think the reason we pray is to get what we want from God. Like, isn't that the purpose of it? Isn't that why we even have this line of communication with God? Because it's just to get what we want from him. Isn't that why we, isn't that why we pray? You know, maybe some of us think that's, The reason we pray, like God is like this genie in a bottle, and if we pray hard enough, if we believe hard enough, if we think hard enough, and we have good positive thoughts and energy, we'll be able to twist the arm of God into giving us something we want. And that is completely not true. And honestly, if you've ever heard that from a church, or if you've ever heard that from um, a, a study you've ever done, they're selling you a complete lie that is birthed in a demonic, demonic teaching from the Bible that's prosperity garbage. Because that's just not true. The reason we pray is not to get what we want from God. That's nonsense. And so why do we pray? Why do we pray? Well, here's why we pray. The reason we pray and the reason we communicate with God is so that we can cooperate with him to fulfill his ultimate will. That's why we pray. So it's, the focus is not necessarily all about me, right? The focus in prayer actually is about the will of God and the glory of God. And cooperating with him to see that ultimate will fulfilled in this life, in this day and age, in this world. In other words, the reason we pray is not to force God into giving us a better life and a more comfortable life. The reason we pray is, listen, to bring glory to God in our life. That's why we pray. Why do we pray, Austin? Here's why. The reason we pray is to bring God glory in our life. The glory of God should be the main focus of our prayers. Do you hear that? This is something that, for whatever reason, isn't talked about all that much. God's glory is the focus of our prayers. Well, all right, pastor, that sounds fine and dandy and sweet and cool, but what does that look like practically? What does that look like actually in our everyday life? How do, or here's one, how do I pray about circumstances that are going on in my life while also maintaining a focus on the glory of God in my prayers? Because isn't that the rub? How do we do this? Well, here's the answer. You pray like Jesus did. You pray like Jesus did. You, you lay out a request. You give reasons as to why that request ought to be fulfilled. And then you ask for that request again. Isn't that what Jesus does in these first five verses? So I suggest that we begin to implement in our prayer life this kind of organization. So here's a hypothetical example. I want to just lay this out before us. I want to pray for my friend's marriage. Maybe you're in a life group and one of the couples in the group is is having a struggling marriage. And so I want to pray for my friend's marriage. Maybe most of us would pray something like this. Um, Father, help their marriage. Uh, I know it's really rough right now. uh, And so ask that you help it. Amen. That's fine. That's great. I love love that. It's good. uh, Praying is good. But I think... This is how Jesus would pray for them. I think Jesus would say something along the lines of, I want to pray for my friend's marriage to be healed so that their kids would see what love between parents look like. I want to pray for my friend's marriage to be healed so that their friends would see that the Holy Spirit can mend even the greatest gaps between two people. Or, Father, I want to pray for my friend's marriage so that their lives together can be an example to the world around them that you can turn dark, gloomy circumstances into beautiful, beautiful, beautiful situations. I think oftentimes when we pray, we need to notice how God's glory should be the desired end result. 
So when we pray, how often is the declaration of God's glory our ultimate aim? I want you to think about that. When we pray, how often is the glory of God truly what we're asking for? I think a helpful way to help us refocus and recalibrate our prayers on God's glory is by using this phrase. I want you to write this down. I suggest we start using this in our prayers. It's a two-word phrase, so that. Start implementing that in your prayers. So that. God, help this person going through cancer. So that. God, help this person who is... um, heartbroken because of their relationship with a loved one so that God continue to provide for our family so that God continue to be near to the brokenhearted so that, so that, so that, so that God's glory can be on display for everyone to see and that in the end, whether it turns out for good or bad, your glory and your renown is what people look at and are in awe of. It's your glory. It's your glory so that your glory will be on display. Friends, listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. This is so important. The glory of God is such a big deal. The glory of God is such a big deal. And sometimes when we hear the word glory, we don't really understand what it means or what it, what it, what it really looks like. But the glory of God is a big deal. And if you're a Christian in this room or listening to this online, I want every single one of you to know exactly how important the glory of God is. And why the glory of God makes a big, big, big stinking impact on your life. Why it makes a huge impact on your life. You know, many times you hear people ask the question of, what is my purpose in life, right? What is my purpose? What's my value? What's my plan? Why was I created? These are questions that not just Christians are asking themselves, but everyone's asking themselves. What is my purpose? Last night, Maddie and I were watching a documentary on pizza. It was awesome. And this guy was saying, he, he grew up in New York City, and he was, he was basically talking about how pizza gave him purpose. Because it was something that he was good at. And it was something that he felt like he was a part of something bigger than himself. And he said that when I was in my younger ages, when I was a young guy, I was just trying to find purpose. I was trying to find meaning, and I couldn't find anything. And then he talked about how, man, and pizza just gave me something that I could just be good in. And it just reminded me as I'm watching this documentary that every single person, Christian or non-Christian, just wants to feel a part of something, just wants to have a purpose. And I know that there are some of us in this room who, at the end of watching you know, The Office for the 817th time at night, we think to ourselves in bed, why am I even here? What is the purpose of my life? What is the end goal of my life? What is it? Well, here it is, friends. Here is the purpose of your life. You say, what is it? God tells us exactly what it is in Isaiah 43, 7. He says this. He says that I created every single person. This is God speaking through the prophet Isaiah. He says, I created every single person. So keep that in mind. You were created by God intentionally, right? Remember, knitted together in your mother's womb. God knows you on such an intimate and deep level. So God created every single one of us. But why? For what purpose? Well, he continues in Isaiah 43, 7, for for this reason you are created, to bring God glory. So what's my purpose in life? Here it is, glorify God. What's my purpose? Glorify God. How do I have meaning in my life? Glorify God. How do I have purpose in my life? Glorify God. How do I live a life that's worth remembering? Glorify God. Over and over and over and over again, the searching should be over, friends. Glorify God. How do I do it in my workplace? Do everything you do as unto the Lord. Whether you eat or you drink, do it all to the glory of God. That's your purpose. That's where your value is found. That's where our identity is rooted in. We are divine instruments of giving God glory in everything we do, everything we say, and everything we think. What's my purpose? It's to give glory. God, glory. That's your purpose. That's your purpose. It's to glorify God. It's not to make more money. It's not to be more successful. It's not to be you know, popular. It's not to be super powerful. I'm not saying that all those things can't happen as you're glorifying God, but the central focus and the central theme of our life, first and foremost, is to bring God glory. It's to exalt him. It's to make him glorified in everything we do. 
I love how the Westminster Catechism describes God. And it was described by a guy named Charles Hodges as the greatest definition of God that's ever been penned on paper. It says that God is an infinite, eternal, unchangeable being with wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. I love that. It's an infinite, eternal, unchangeable being with wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. And, and, and here's the crazy thing. You and I have the privilege of just showing the world a sliver of that goodness of God. You and I have a privilege of just showing the world just a little bit of what God's glory looks like. That's your purpose. That's my purpose. That's what we're here for. In other words, our lives are all about him. They're not all about you. Not all about you. It's about bringing him glory. And this is hard for some of us to understand. This was particularly hard for a man by the name of Louis XIV to understand. You see, in 1715, Louis the XIV, or better known as Louis the Great, passed away. And if you're not, I assume most of us aren't, but if you're not read up on your French history, um, you, you, you may not be aware of who Louis the XIV is. Louis the XIV was widely regarded as the greatest king of France, right? He was called Louis the Great. Under him, France saw unbelievable prosperity and just productivity. They were really elevated on the world stage, and Louis the XIV was revered as one of the greatest leaders of the day. I mean, he's the guy who kind of infamously, famously said that I am the state, all right? Anybody who says that they are something like that is just, you know, I am the law, or I am the state, or I am science, or anything like that. I just look at it and go, okay, buddy. Um, but Louis the Fourteenth was this kind of guy, but he did a lot of, lot of big things. So as you can gather, this guy had a lot going for him, and even when he passed, he had an ornate process of the way in which he was supposed to be revered for his passing. And so get this. He planned to pass away in the Palace of Versailles. So if you've ever been there, you know that this place is remarkable. It truly is one of the most incredible buildings on the face of the earth. He was to pass away in the Palace of Versailles, and then immediately after he passed away, he was to be placed into this golden coffin. And you can Google this golden coffin, folks. Let me tell you, this puts Raiders of the Lost Ark to shame. All right, this is a nice golden coffin. He was placed in this golden coffin and then his body was to be immediately transferred to the Cathedral of Notre Dame, another splendid building. If you've ever been to France, Maddie and I were there a few years back, you just look at this building and go, oh my goodness, this is some incredible architectural creativity going into this building. And then at his funeral, every single light, get this, was to be turned off and snuffed out. So picture the streets of Paris, right? If you're familiar with where the Notre Dame Cathedral is, picture everywhere around the river, the river that runs right next to the Notre Dame, picture, picture all of the, the streets around, just all of the lights turned off. It was ordered all of the lights to be turned off, except there was one little candle that was burning above the golden coffin of Louis XIV, of Louis the Great. And the reason for this is obvious. All of the attention was on the great Louis. All of the attention was on this one candle which signified the presence of this one man. And so, right before the funeral was started, hundreds and hundreds of people are filing in. Everybody's very somber. Everybody's very quiet. And then there was a bishop who was going to oversee the funeral processions. And his name was Bishop Mas Masillon, I think, I think is how it's pronounced. And when the service started, he walked up in this packed, beautiful, gothic building and he walks up to the front and he walks right up next to the coffin of Louis XIV and he snuffed out the candle. He just... Can you imagine everybody? Oh, did he seriously just do that? And then he walks up to the lectern. He turns to the crowd and he says, only God is great. <laughs> and then... He begins to preach a sermon on how our life is like a withering grass and how it's like a mist that comes and go and how the greatness of this life is not measured by how many people are at your funeral, by, not measured by how much success you have, not measured by what kind of coffin you are laid in or how much power or authority we exercise in our life, but instead how our life's purpose is bringing glory to God in everything we do. And if anybody is going to be made great in our life, it's God. That's a sermon he preached at Louis XIV, Louis the Great's funeral. My question for you is, is God glorified in your life? 
Is God glorified in your life? Is God glorified in your prayers? Or are we living our lives making sure that all of the attention, all of the focus, and all of the adulation is just upon that little candle that we burn bright over ourselves to make sure that everybody can see everything that we do and how special we are? Or is our life just one big, giant flashlight pointing, saying, hey, all to the glory of God. This isn't me. This is, this is Jesus. This is God. This is the regeneration that he gave me as a sinner, as a fallen person. Oh, yeah, sure, I did that well, but hey, guess what? God gave me the ability to do it. Like, I, God, it, it was him. It was him. It was him. It was glory to God. Or are we just functional narcissistic, making sure that everything's about us? I hope that as a church here that we are people who glorify God in every area of our life. But I think the first area that we can start is in our prayers. Praying in such a way which makes it clear that our life is about God. Posturing ourselves in such a way that is clear that this is about God. One thing I really appreciate about the way in which the, the Jewish people prayed and I uh, really appreciate about the way that perhaps Jesus was praying here with his eyes up and with his head up, his eyes open and his hands outstretched is there's a sense of expectancy. And so they talk about this in, in, in Jewish writings. So when they would lift their hands up, it was an expectancy of like, God, I'm giving everything to you, but simultaneously I'm expecting that you're gonna do something incredible in my life, whether that be a good thing or a bad thing. In the end, it's all about you. There's a sense of focus. There's a posture which indicates a sense of reverence for who God is. Do we have that kind of reverence for who God is? Do we have that kind of understanding of the glory and the majesty of who God is, I hope that as a church here and as individuals, we would not have misplaced glory in our life and that we would be a giant light shining for him. So is our life being lived for the glory of God or is it being lived for the glory of ourself? We see here in John 17, one through five, that Jesus was glorifying the Father. Well, are we glorifying our Savior, Jesus? And you're saying, okay, well, what does this look like in our life? How can I glorify God? There's three things I want to share with you today. First and foremost, the first most basic step is if you're not a believer, you need to believe. If you're not a believer, if you're not a Christian, you're not glorifying God. You need to believe in Jesus. That's the first thing. You need to believe in him. Recognize him for who he is, that he is that infinite, eternal, unchangeable being with wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth, and that you need him desperately. We need to believe in Jesus. Number two, we need to talk with Jesus. We need to communicate with him. We need to actually have a relationship with him. You know, I was thinking this week and I was thinking to myself, if my relationship just consisted of little text messages to my wife throughout the day and that was it, she would be ticked, especially my wife. Some of you are like, that would be a dream. <laughs> it would not work, but sometimes isn't that kind of how we treat God when it comes to communicating with him? Just like, oh, look, I'm, I'm going to stop light, pray. God, thank you for good traffic. Hey, that's fine and dandy. I like texting my wife. It's good, but that's no kind of relationship. Maybe we need to be more intentional with the way we pray. We need to talk with Jesus. And then number three, we need to not just talk. We need to live for Jesus. We need to live for Jesus. We need to be those individuals that are examples of how the glory of God has radically changed our lives and that we can't go on without that all-powerful being and presence in our life. And so you want to glorify God? Number one, it starts by believing in him. Number two, let's talk to him. Actually talk to him instead of sending text messages to him. And then number three, let's live for him. Let's live for him. Let's glorify God. And so can we all bow our heads right now as Brian is making his way back up here to close our time in prayer? I want to pray for us. I want to pray for us as we close our service. And um, I want us to be thinking right now just about, about what it means to pray and what it means to give God glory. And maybe some of us need to repent of an attitude or a lifestyle that is not focused on the glory of God. Um, well, now is the time to just repent of that and say, Lord, I'm living for you. May your glory be in my life. And so let's pray, friends. Father, we, we thank you so much for our time today. We thank you for John 17. We thank you for getting a, a glimpse into what your prayer truly does look like. Father, I, I, I pray right now that, that we as a church would be so incredibly focused on your glory that, that in everything we do, it is clear and obvious that, that you are the one who deserves all praise and that you are the one who deserves all credit, Lord. Father, I, I pray that you would continue to bless our church here, Lord, so that we can continue to um, 
model and exemplify what Christians look like and how Christians should act and how Christians should be in this world. Father, may you grant us continued favor, God, so that again, you may be exalted. We love you, Jesus, and we um, thank you for everyone who's a part of this church, and thank you for everyone who's a part of helping us set up and, and helping us tear down, Lord. We do that for your glory. We do it all for your name to be renowned, Lord. Father, I also just pray for anybody here who does not know you, who is not a believer, who does not have a relationship with you. Father, may today be the day where they, where they realize that glory is not about them, it's about you, and that you deserve all of it. Father, may they today realize that that you are the way and the truth and the life and that they cannot be saved without you. May today be the day of salvation. We love you, Jesus, and we pray these things in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. Amen.